Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato, Mary Gamble will be joined by our good friend Paul DeMay in just a second. Mary, let's kick off Lessons in Leadership. Tell everyone who our terrific sponsors are. Sure, definitely. Well, first, I do want to say where you can find our other great segments on stand-deliver.com. They're all on our website, which is fantastic. Uh, and we have such great partners. We have Valley Bank, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Prager Metis, Veolia, uh, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Seton Hall University and the Bassino Leadership Institute, the North Ward Center and Kessler Foundation, and last but not least, Delta Dental of New Jersey. That's right. Yes. And speaking of Delta Dental, we're honored for the first time to have uh, Paul DeMeo, General Counsel, Chief Administrative Officer at Delta Dental of New Jersey. Good to see you, Paul. Thanks, Steve. Good to see you. Hi, Mary. Hello there. This, this is your first of what I'm confident will be many visits to Lessons Leadership. Hey, Paul, right out of the box, I'm curious about this. Um, everyone develops their own leadership style, philosophy, approach, come from a lot of places. Any one significant influence on you as it relates to your style, person, event, what? Because there are a million things I know. Yeah, no, there's a lot. I mean, if I had to point, I mean, it, it's sort of cliche, but it, it's a good cliche. It would be, it'd be my parents, my dad, you know, just kind of good people honest people, straightforward people expect to be treated uh, as you would treat somebody, be truthful, put your nose down, do the work. And, um, you know, good things usually happen. And if they don't um, find, you know, find a way to make it happen. Um, Where'd you grow up? I grew up in New Jersey in Old Bridge, Central in Jersey. Old... Central Jersey does exist. Just so it everyone does. Knows. I, 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 grew I grew up, up in... there. <laughs> I grew up in Fords, and I would say Fords, Old Bridge, that whole area. My dad worked in East Brunswick. That is definitely Central Jersey. Yes, Fords we'll is it. not in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <Steve. laughs> okay, Elvin is putting in the chat. I live in Old Bridge. Elvin, thank you for sharing that. Oh, Elvin shout looked out. like a man of dignity when I saw him. So good for you, Elvin. You're very perceptive, Paul. He is that and more. A couple of other things I want to jump into before Mary gets into uh, into this. Our, our partnership with Delta Dental is is vast on a lot of levels. But one of the areas we've been focusing on lessons in leadership with the support of Delta Dental um, is small business. Do you believe there's any significant difference, Paul, between being a great leader of a smaller business, ours, a smaller business, or a very large company like yours or another very large corporation, multinational? Do you think there's any difference in being a great leader in a different kind of organization? I, I think that's a good question. I would say fundamentally no, um, but I think there are, are clearly sort of, I would say practical differences where leaders in large companies often don't know exactly what's going on in those companies throughout the world. Um, and they need to project certainly um, a connection with their, with their staffs and their employee base. Um, and leaders of small companies clearly would have more of a probably hands-on approach um, and knowledge of, of more of the details down, down in the, into the organization. But I think, again, fundamentally, though, it's really a matter of um, setting an example um, for people in, in, in being and in having integrity, having drive, mm -hmm. um, inclusiveness, um, respect for people, um, having holding people accountable um, by holding yourself accountable, mostly. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, getting out of the way of, of the people that you hire so they can do the job better than you probably and most definitely can. Speaking of getting out of the way, I have to often get out of the way of Mary Gamba. Mary Gamba, you're up. Yeah, definitely. And you talk about all those traits and it's interesting, Steve, we have not actually talked about the millennials or whatever this new 20 something generation mm -hmm. is. Paul, do you feel that it's more challenging because I feel like that generation is getting a very bad reputation. Is it more challenging to instill those same qualities of grit, resilience, hardworking, uh, and really just fighting for what they want? Do you find it more challenging for the younger generation than for their people in their 40s, 50s, 60s? I think it's more challenging for me, full disclosure, in my 50s to um, understand more what they want. They they have drive. They have determination. It just may be different than what what you know. I grew up um, as a, in a conventional world of you know go to college. I went to law school, work you know ridiculous hours to try to you know get ahead and, and things like that. I, I don't think um, most of the of the newer generation really sees that as. Um, 
as a path for them. <clears throat> they want other things. They want personal time. They want a connection. Um, um, although they don't want to actually come to work and physically, that's an interesting dynamic, but they do want a connection with, with work and the connection with the community. Um, they enjoy being remote. That's what I was getting at, Steve, uh, the, you know, um, in the new environment. Um, but I think it's more of um, it, 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 the onus is on leadership to understand what those drives are. They're just they, they have drive, they have enthusiasm, they have motivation and ambition, but it may just be slightly different than what we're used to. And it's really a matter of tapping into that um, and, and, and making sure that they feel what they're doing um, matters or makes a difference. Yeah, I'm gonna complicate it for both of you right now because Paul's hit on something and Mary's question has triggered a lot of this. So Mary, I got all these props here my great great book right great see I'm talking about a man of dignity a man who's well read as well so 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 Paul here's the thing uh, our our company stand and deliver for 20 years plus leadership development coaching trying to help people be better leaders better communicators on any platform blah 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 so do you, when it comes to coaching helping to develop younger people and explaining the importance of grit, explaining the importance of, I know you want to get ahead. I know you want to have a very nice balance in your life. That's important. But just do the work and put your nose down. It's, in my view, it's, it's sometimes harder to coach younger people because I can't figure out how to get to them. I don't want to overcomplicate this, but in leadership development, how the heck do you develop them to be leaders when their worldview is so dramatically different from quote old school folks like some of us? Loaded yeah, question, no, I know, Paul. No, that's a, that's a good point. It's, a, it's probably you know a, a four course um, you know <laughs> le le lesson to, and I could probably take it. Um, <clears throat> I think you know there's a there's a simple way through some of that. One is hiring the people that have those qualities in the first place, and, and, and kind of rooting that out in the hiring process so that you don't have to really spend a lot of time um, trying to get them motivated. Um, but I get, I guess, you know, changing it differently to, to answer more directly your, your, your question, you just have to offer, we have, you know, Delta is really, is, is really good. And Dennis really drives this, you know, a lot of- Dennis Wilson, uh, our CEO, I'm sorry. Yeah, Dennis Wilson, our CEO, sorry, yeah. Um, a lot of personal leadership experience that that we in our in our group um, push out to the uh, the workforce, and it's not just managers; it's it's every level of the organization can take part in that, um, and it's understand the importance of leadership, the impact you may have as a as an individual contributing. Um, you don't need to have to manage people to be a leader, um, and we offer a lot of different. Um, assignments, a lot of different volunteering opportunities. I think Delta is extremely rare in this regard. Um, we have a very big commitment to community. Uh, sure. We have- Special Olympics. Of, what's that? Special Olympics, supporting Special Olympics and countless other organizations. Yeah, countless other. I mean, I'm on the Big Brothers, Big Sisters uh, board, and it, uh, it's just tremendous. And again, our leadership and our board really encourages that uh, for all associates to take part in those kinds of things. So it's tapping into their to their interests, tapping into their their connections to the community. It helps build that. And once you do that and you make a connection, you could actually see the talent um, in the organization that you might not otherwise get a chance to see. Mm. Um, and then you can further look to develop that. Um, and I think it, once you kind of get people moving, um, they see other people moving and it also, and it has, you know, sort of a sentinel effect in that regard. Um, it's not perfect. No, nothing is, it doesn't solve all the problems, but um, getting people involved in things maybe other than work actually leads to better uh, leadership experiences in the company. It's interesting, Mary, before you jump in with the last question here for Paul, one of the other things is you help develop younger people and anyone could leave at any time your organization and retention is key. But I'm also quite aware of the time and effort you invest in younger people who disproportionately, it's not a criticism, they do leave. 
And that's part of the process. And for leaders, wow, at least for me, it's very tough. Mary, last question for Paul. Yeah, definitely. Uh, especially as you talked about, a lot of these, the younger generation likes to work from home. How do you keep those folks engaged? I know you talked about community service and bringing them physically together, uh, but what advice do you have for managers, leaders who truly are leading in a hybrid workforce uh, post the pandemic? Yeah, I think it's very, it's really difficult. And I think it's also specific as to the team and the function. Um, a lot, a lot of the technical folks like to be alone, oftentimes like to do their work and and um, you know, not not necessarily engage, but I think it's important from a management perspective as well as a team perspective to hold events. We do happy half hours. We do you know a, a, lots of things like that that are fun events, whether it's Jeopardy, just getting people to look at each other on the on the screen um, and having them engage, actually speak instead of having everybody on 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 mute um, to get some level of engagement. Um, because I think seeing people and actually communicating with them um, in in the virtual way, it, it does kind of count. Um, I don't I, I, I'm a my style is very informal and kind of rather do it by walking around. But nonetheless, you know, you have to adapt to to what's going on now, what people want um, in, in, a, in a large uh, in large portion. So um, that's the way you do it. You just you try to stay animated. You try to um, have the meetings, you try to have events um, that people enjoy. Um, and I've found, you know, in doing this job that they do, we, we do enjoy getting together at four o'clock on a Thursday for an hour to talk about, you know, literally dozens and dozens of employees will talk about, you know, our last meeting was our favorite concert, right? And, and people just uh, provide their experiences at the, you know, the Jethro Tull concert or, you know, whatever it was. And, and you see some of the younger folks going, I, I don't know who, you know, that person who's, you know, Led Zeppelin. <laughs> All right. So, so, but it gets that conversation going sure. about, um, you know, what people's experiences are. And it sort of, it, it, it does make a, a, make for a better connection. Hey, Paul, before I let you go, are you ready? Uh, I know we're out of time, but Mary, Paul, put it out there. Best concert. I'm ready to go. Paul, you ready to go? Mary, you ready to go? I'm I'm yeah. always ready. Yeah. Mary, go. Best concert. You're not going to believe this. My favorite concert was Metallica. Paul, That's best concert. Best concert, Bob Seger. Bob Seger and the uh, Silver Bullet Band. Yeah. Uh, Elvin, best concert. Kirk Franklin and Maverick City. What is it? Kirk Franklin and Maverick City, gospel artists. All right, you ready? Best concert. Luther Vandross, New Jersey Performing Arts Center with my wife. I asked her to marry me that night. Oh my Aww. gosh. I, I, I worked there <laughs> no for fair. four years, Steve. You work where? I picked up garbage and worked backstage at the Garden State Arts Center for four years through no, college. No. <laughs> Garden State Arts Center. Hey, at Garden State Arts Center, it was James Taylor, but at and the New Jersey Performing Arts Center in oh. Newark. It was oh, Park. okay. Okay. Yeah. That was Luther Vandross. Just, <laughs> all right. Um, Frank, we'll get to Frank another time. And, Scarlin will check you out your best uh, concert, if you will. Hey, Paul, thank you so much for joining us. To the team at Delta Dental, to Dennis and Randy and our great friends there, thanks so much. Thank, thank you all and appreciate the time. Have a great day. Great having you. Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba. That's Paul. We'll be right back after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. Construction companies work at the heart of our communities. So do the operating engineers of Local 825, who build our roads and bridges and ensure the safe transmission of energy that keeps us on the move. 
Local 825 works with contractors as partners in quality, safety, and training. Our achievements stand as monuments to collaboration that will last for generations. This message has been brought to you by the members of Operating Engineers Local 825. Better building begins here. I'm joined by my colleague, Mary Gamba, and we are honored to have, once again with us, Michelle Aceto, who's Executive Vice President, Chief Nursing Officer at Holy Name. Good to see you, Michelle. Good to see you, Steve. Uh, Michelle, we are taping this in the fall of 2022. Incredibly difficult times, uh, challenging times, evolving times for you. Again, we're talking leadership, but larger question about nursing, if you will. How challenging is this time as a nurse slash nurse leader um, two and a half, getting closer, believe it or not, to almost three years into this pandemic. How difficult, one to 10, A and B, how the heck are you dealing with it? Yeah. So on a scale of one to 10, this is probably a 10. Never has it been this difficult. I've been a nurse a very long time. We've seen shortages. That is typical of this profession. You see the peaks and the valleys, but this is really one of the most difficult times coming off a pandemic when nurses truly stepped up, but took a good hard look, many of them at their own age and health situations and decided to either retire, cut back, change their status to per diem. And that left us with a lot of holes. You know, it left us with a feeling of what are we going to do to cover these situations? People come in sicker, more complex care is required. And so we've really had a lot of sit down meetings, leadership meetings involving you know, some of the bedside staff, the managers and the VP level to say, what is it do we have to do to make sure we get nurses engaged, bring people to nursing schools and then keep them? You can get them here, but if you don't do everything in your power as a leader to keep them, then, you know, it's all for naught. And it sure is. And we talk about retention, retaining your best people in media. Could you imagine retaining your best people in healthcare, Mary, how much more? The stakes are much higher. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, the, the stakes are so much higher. And, and one thing that we talk about as well is that burnout factor. And are there ways that you encourage, um, you know, leading your nurses, are there ways that you encourage them to find those outlets, whether it's yoga, meditation, what are you doing to make sure that not only are they focusing on their patients and their families, but they're also focusing on themselves? Yeah. You know, during the pandemic, we had uh, quite the restriction to time off and vacations. Not that anyone could enjoy a vacation, but certainly we did restrict the time off. As soon as we were able to lift that, we did encourage people, take your time off. Don't store it. You need that time. When you're here during the workday and it's your break time, go to the cafeteria, step outside, step away from the unit so that you can start to clear your head. We really thought that was important for people, especially with all of the restrictions that we had around the holidays and you know, their own self-imposed restrictions. I didn't want to be near my family because I thought I could infect them. So now we really do encourage that. We also encourage the units to do things together, a uh, sip and paint or, you know, go bowling or just, you know, dinner as, as a group so that they can see each other also as humans and not just the caregiver next to me. So I'm curious about this. The biggest reason you got into nursing when you got into nursing was what? Because I'm gonna pivot and follow up that question as to going into nursing today and whether it's a totally different equation, Michelle. You know, when I was in high school, I quickly realized that nursing was where I wanted to be. I wanted to understand the functionality of the body and the best ways to help somebody achieve their top ability in their body, how to get back to the healthiest person that they can be so that they could lead the life that they envisioned with their family to do things and to help educate patients how to stay in that healthy part of life, to avoid repeat admissions, to avoid constant illness. And yet today, I think that a lot of people are entering the field maybe because they realize that they can help. Certainly we saw a significant increase in the School of Nursing admissions. We have a School of Nursing, the Sister Claire Tynan School of Nursing attached to the hospital. And during the pandemic, those months after, we saw a 100% increase in our application rate. And because people realized I can help, I can make a difference. I wanna be there at the bedside. 
Now, if we were able to take all of them into our school, that would have been wonderful. But like many schools across the country, the faculty are aging, the clinical sites are limited. So we had to, of course, limit the number of students we could take. We did just graduate our largest class, so there is hope for the future. But I think people really saw the, you know, the banging of the pots and look at you guys, your heroes, and they realized, you know what, I can be part of that. Yeah. Mary, I'm going to have you jump back in, but what about after the banging of the pots, after mm -hmm. your heroes, nurses on the other end of anger, of vitriol, of violence, of whatever? Well, you know what, Steve, we did see a lot of that. We saw patients who were angry, family members who were angry because we still couldn't let them in in fear that they would spread the illness or you know, other things could happen and they really were angry with us. But we worked closely with the staff to de-escalate, to not make people feel like, no, you're wrong and I'm right. We work very hard to de-escalate, to diffuse situations and, you know, make accommodations. Certainly accommodations were made for anybody who was end of life, but you know, for the person who was in a two bedded room and they were gonna be there a day or two, we really tried to help families understand why we couldn't have five visitors, why we could only have one and you know, let, let's work together. But you know, it has been difficult. You go from hero to zero pretty quickly and it's, it's not easy, it's not easy. Hero to zero, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, a lot of what Steve and I talk about on lessons and lessons in leadership is empathy. And I don't feel like there's enough that we're doing to really teach people to be more empathetic, especially as you said, these nurses are, are facing such adversity, not only with the challenges they face with their the patients, but then the violence issue, et cetera. What are you doing in terms of that connection between leadership and empathy, helping your nurses to truly remain maintain that level of empathy as they're working with their patients? You know, it, it is something that a nurse has innately, I believe, is to be empathetic. So, you know, we make sure our staff knows that we've got their back. And so whatever you need to do to empathize with the patient and help them feel comfortable and the family understand the path of their illness, whether it is going to be a path to hospice or a path, a path to going home and resuming normal activities, we try to work with everyone at their own level. So, you know, for the very anxious patient, our first goal is to de-escalate that anxiety. For the patient who, you know, has disinterest and, you know, just speak to my wife, she takes care of me. We make sure we involve the wife. But, you know, for the nurse, that can be very strenuous because sometimes you just feel like you're repeating yourself time and again. And so we really work with the nurses to help them understand we've got your back. And if this is too much for you, then you call your manager or call your, one of your peers to step in. Nobody here is expected to do it all. And there was a time when, when you did feel like that in nursing. When I first joined, you know, you did it all. These were your patients. This was your problem. You took care of it. But we've really peeled away from that so that the nursing staff knows, you know, I can't do it all and I do need help. Yes, the patient needs help, but sometimes I need help too. And we want to be there for them. Before I let you go, Michelle, I asked you how challenging the time is on a scale from one to 10 for the nurses, uh, for nursing or in nursing and nursing profession on a scale from one to 10 for you, put you on the spot. Your level of passion and enthusiasm for the field of nursing today is? I am more enthusiastic today, I would have to say it's a level 10 than ever before. You know, the responsibility nurses have is, is great, but it is a great trust that we have. When a patient comes here, their life is literally sitting in our hands. We see them 12 hours a day. Unlike the provider who comes in, checks on them, writes the orders, the nurse is in and out. We get to know them better than anyone else in the care team. And that really makes me feel good that we can understand them and help them. I've had Michelle on a few times and I'm not, I'm not really surprised by what she just had to say. My instinct, my gut told me you were going to say it was a 10 and explain it the way you did. And Michelle, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Great to see you. Have a nice day. You got to stay with us. We'll be right back. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.
Uh, welcome back to the last couple of minutes of Lessons in Leadership. Mary, I want to promote this book and read a little section from it that you, you see, why did, I, why did you send me this book? The Book of Joy. I felt that there was a time that we all needed a little bit more joy in our lives. And I had stumbled across that book on Audible. It was highly rated. And I had always found myself to be very introspective and meditative. But once I read that book, it was all about perspective. So go ahead and you take it from there. And it's written by the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the part that got me. I, you sent me this book and then a day later I started marking it up and send Mary Love this. That. They talk about uh, They talk about mental pain. They talk about pain and anxiety and, and having a positive attitude, et cetera, et cetera. And the Dalai Lama talks about, quote, mental immunity. I said, what? Mental immunity. Here it is. Mental immunity is just learning to avoid the destructive emotions and to develop the positive ones. First, you must understand the mind. There are so many different states of mind, the diverse thoughts, blah, 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 blah. Um, some of these thoughts and emotions are harmful, even toxic, while others are healthy and healing. They go on and on to say, we must prepare ourselves with mental immunity because it creates a healthy disposition of the mind so we will be less susceptible to negative thoughts and feelings. Mary, mental immunity? It is like anything else in life, Steve. It's all about perspective. It's all about putting yourself in the right frame of mind. Every day I wake up, I'm going to be positive. I'm going to be productive. That My mantra every single day before I swing my feet out of bed, I always say that. Because if not, your first instinct as a human being is to start that spiral thinking, what could go wrong today? Complaining, I, complaining. I know, complaining. And I try to never complain. If I find myself doing it, I will catch myself. If you really put things into perspective, we have things so much better than everyone else. Even people who are at their lowest of low, there's always somebody else who is dealing with something so much worse. So it's all mind games, but a healthy mind game. What does that have to do with leadership? Everything to do with leadership. If you are going to be reactive as a leader, if you are going to blow your 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 you know your top because something goes wrong, if you're going to make a mountain out of a molehill, or maybe it is a mountain, maybe that problem that happened really is egregious and it's a huge error. The only thing you're going to do by losing your cool is demotivating your team, and nothing good's going to happen from that. Mary, why is this why is this book relevant? Don't sweat the small stuff. Minute left. Yeah. And you do need to sweat the small stuff to some degree. You can't just ignore everything because then the small stuff becomes the big stuff, but everything needs to be relative. Everything needs to be um, really proportionate to what happened. And again, even if it's something so, so bad, it's going to be okay because there's no other is alternative. It? Is it? It is. It is. Absolutely. There, there's no alternative. If you sit there and you know bury your head in the sand or scream like the sky is falling, nothing good is going to come of it. Is that why you have no patience or virtually no patience when I do some of those things? Oh, that's exactly why. And you and I have gotten better. I almost want to have a safe word. Like when the kids were younger, Bill and I had a safe word watermelon when they were sleeping. But Bill's her husband. It's not yes. just some guy. But if you say they're sleeping, the kids would hear the S. So we would say watermelon. So I need to have that safe word with you where I, if I see you spiraling, I'll just say watermelon from now on. That'll be our safe word. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got to think of a better safe word than watermelon, but we need one. And Elvin had a word. You know what he said in the, in the chat? Goodbye. Goodbye. That's Mary. This is Steve. This has been our therapy, Lessons in Leadership. See you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. Construction companies work at the heart of our communities. So do the operating engineers of Local 825, who build our roads and bridges and ensure the safe transmission of energy that keeps us on the move. 
Local 825 works with contractors as partners in quality, safety, and training. Our achievements stand as monuments to collaboration that will last for generations. This message has been brought to you by the members of Operating Engineers Local 825. Better building begins here.